Hello everyone, my name is Eric Jones, better known as a turf teacher. Welcome to the course entitled Pesticide Labeling. This information comes directly from Chapter 4 in your North Carolina Pesticide Applicator Certification Core Manual. So let's go ahead and look at our course objectives. Hopefully you've already read the chapter. I highly recommend that you read the chapter prior to uh, watching the lecture. And then as you're listening to the lecture, pull out a highlighter and kind of highlight the things that we talk about in uh, the textbook. So our objective is we're going to distinguish between a label and a labeling. There's two different things. Now the label is a part of the labeling, but the labeling is not a part of the label. See, there is a difference there. We're going to talk about that. Understand registration differences between federal EPA and special local needs and emergency exemptions. There's going to be times, guys, where the federal government is going to have to step in and say, yes, you can use this pesticide even though the EPA has not registered it. And then we'll find the brand, chemical, and common name on a label. And then we're going to identify active ingredient percentage in a pesticide formulation, and then understand the wording used on labels and its meanings, whether it's danger poison, danger warning, and caution, and then identify what a material safety data sheet is, or MSDS. And those are your objectives for Chapter 4. And so label or labeling. Label is the information that is attached or printed on a pesticide container. It is the, 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 the sticky back part that is glued to the container. And actually it's got a little sticky strip down the side. You can pull it back and then inside of that is uh, a lot of information. Now your labeling. Your labeling can be anything that the uh, dealer that you purchase a pesticide gives you from. It's stuff that you download on the internet. It's any pamphlet or information that you can pick up from a cooperative extension agent. Labeling is that information referenced on a label or received from the point of sale uh, or the manufacturer. But remember, the label is attached to the container. Now, yes, you can go and download a label for the pesticide that you just purchased on the internet. Now that's what I recommend doing. What we used to do in our trucks, guys, is for every pesticide that was on the vehicle, whether it be a lawn maintenance truck or one of our lawn care applicator uh, vehicles, we would have a notebook in there. We kept a copy of the label. We kept all the labeling that we received from the manufacturer or the extension agent. And then we kept the MSDS sheet all in a spiral bound notebook. So our lawn maintenance crews that are out spraying weeds after they've mowed the property, they would just have it for either Roundup or Finale, whichever chemical they were using that day. But it was kept neat and nice in it. But we also kept the label attached to the container. But as you know, there's going to be rainstorms. There's going to be, um, you know, something brushes up against the container. There's dirt, dirt, mud, uh, pine straw, whatever, uh, mulch that gets up against it. And some of that starts to wear. So always keep a clean copy uh, in the truck. And now you need to have that. I know we've got cell phones, we've got iPads in the truck, but guys, it's a lot easier to keep that in a three ring binder so you can just grab it and show it to the extension agent uh, if they decide to do an inspection on you. And it uh, can include leaflets or brochures, but remember, label is the law, guys. The labeling's not. Label is the law. And some of that label, I've actually seen um, the pesticide containers actually have a little book that looks like, almost like the size of an index card, but it's thick, and it's actually glued to the container. De just depends on what chemical that you get. Some of them will be like the half a sheet of paper, so you know probably um, eight and a half by like five inches, and it's glued to it. And then, like I said, you peel it from the side, and it's got all that pertinent information in there. But that is the label. EPA approval or Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA. It takes a minimum of six years for the EPA to approve a pesticide and during those six years they're going to determine the level of toxicity. They're going to see if the pesticide has any residual activity in the environment and then what hazards or precautionary statements that they must add to the pesticide. So you think about it, you come up with this cool chemical, if you're a chemist, if you're in a lab somewhere and you come up with this idea. It's going to take you six years minimum before you can even get it on the uh, the shelf to sell uh, to to people. So it's a lot of a lot of investigative work that goes on uh, with the EPA getting a uh, pesticide uh, approved for sale. Now this is a fictitious label and it's only used for educational purposes but Rondo herbicide. 
It has been approved by the EPA. It's going to have an EPA registration number there of 333-111-222. That is the uh, fictional uh, EPA registration number. And you can also look at the active ingredient. It has glyphosate. So this is a generic form of Roundup. And they're calling it Roundo or Rondo herbicide, kind of mimicking uh, the, uh, the Roundup label. But there you can see the precautionary statements, hazardous to humans and domestic animals, and keep out of the reach of children. So that is some pertinent information you would find on a label. And your textbook has a good, good label for nematodes um, 3E or nomatodes, nomotodes, remember no more toads for nematodes, nomatodes 3E, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But your class and registration, it's going to be based on the use, whether it's restricted or general use. Now, if you remember from the previous lectures, you know, restricted use pesticide, you must uh, have a pesticide license or work directly underneath the supervision of a pesticide applicator. But you need to, I'd go ahead and be certified across the board and have my license if I'm doing restricted use pesticide. I wouldn't do it any other way. And I'm not going to let a employee of mine go and do it. I'm going to do it. I'm the license holder. I'm going to go do that restricted use pesticide. But not anybody can just go get the restricted use pesticide. Got to have that license to purchase it. General use pesticide, that's stuff that you're going to pick up at the big box stores. The homeowner is going to be able to, to apply that. Now, a lot of the pesticides we use are general use. You know, we seldom, very seldom use a restricted use pesticide. Yes, you know, if we're doing fumigation on, you know, um, plastic culture, yes, that's restricted use pesticide. But, you know, we're, we're actually subbing that out. We're not even doing that on the farm anymore. But your... Uh, uh, you know, your use is going to be based on the application, how it's going to be loaded, how it's going to be mixed. And guys, that is, when you're loading and mixing pesticide, that's when you're probably the most vulnerable uh, to getting exposed to it because you're dealing with the concentrate. You're dealing with the whole container. And that stuff can splash on you. You breathe it in, all kinds of stuff. So you have to wear that PPE when loading and mixing, especially, especially loading and mixing. And guys, the PPE may be different uh, when loading and mixing it versus then applying it. So always read that label. Transport it's going to include the transportation storage handling after breaking the seal, how equipment is cared for and maintained. It's going to tell you how to clean it. And then how to dispose of the container is all going to be uh, within the label. Now, your minimum risk pesticide, it's exempt from the EPA registration. It does not have to get uh, certified or I guess, termed for sale by the EPA, but it does have to have North Carolina uh, registration. It has to be registered with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, and there's really no label requirements uh, from the EPA if it is a minimum risk pesticide. Very seldom. Uh, we're, we're not going to be doing it. That again, I always think of the homeowner uh, going to a big box store. Um, standard registrations, you as a certified pesticide applicator are responsible for only applying the pesticides registered with the EPA. You need to check, you need to do it. Don't get a call from your uncle and say, hey, grandpa had some chemical out here in the barn. We know he's gone. We, we know you out there spraying turf. We want to see if you want to put this stuff out there. Don't do it, guys. That's when you need to take that chemical to a, a local kind of a um, amnesty day. Of, of reminds me of the military you know you always had the amnesty buck when you come off the rifle range you know, they kind of have the same thing similar with pesticides if you have old pesticides and stuff you can go and turn them in and use the department of ag will have a couple days um you know throughout the year that you can actually do that but don't apply the pesticide unless you know it's registered with the epa your uh, special local need registrations, and that is talking about on page 55 in your textbook, allows the states to expand the use of certain pesticides for use for targets not specifically listed on the label. So we know a pesticide is going to take care of a certain insect or a certain disease, but it's not written for the label. We can get a special local needs registration to do that. Um, those are recognized as 24C. Uh, registrations of special local needs just know that and guys make sure that you have the uh, special local needs labeling in your possession at the time you're applying that pesticide because it's not on the label you've actually got to have that that special label that says that you can actually put it out here now let's look at the uh, um, the special local need label here enlist duo for control of annual and perennial weeds 
and use on enlist corn, soybeans, and cotton use as a non-selective burn down chemical fallow and use as a pre-plant or pre-emergent or post-emergent herbicide on listed crops for control of emerged weeds. Now, for distribution and use only in the state of Georgia. Well, let's say here in North Carolina, boom, we have a situation where we know this is gonna work. We've got to do it quick. We can get that special local needs uh, permit and actually use the FIFRA Section 24C special local needs label. Uh, emergency exemptions based on public health emergencies. Guys, that's, you know, again, I love the whole um, infectious disease kind of thing. If something were to break out like that, this is when, you know, Uncle Sam's going to step in and they're going to take care of the, uh, the health emergency. And it allows for the use of a pesticide that is not registered for use. So this brainstorm scientist comes up with this idea that this will take care of something that's killing humans um, in a certain area of the world or the United States because it's the EPA, you know, we could actually go and use that pesticide with a, an emergency exemption because we, we've deemed that it worked on the first group of test animals or whatever, and we need to get it out there because it's a national emergency situation. Again, guys, the pesticide label, it is the law. The label is the legal document with instructions on mixing, applying, storing, and disposing of the pesticides. Now that big word there, applying the pesticides. I've seen guys, guys, even spraying Roundup, you know, you know, if you're mixing one ounce per gallon or two ounce per gallon, I've seen guys cut the top of a Pepsi can off, pour a little bit in there and kind of guesstimate how much is in there. Well, what if they've got too much? If you put way more ounces per gallon than the label requires, no matter what the pesticide is, you're in violation of the label and you're committing a crime. The label is the law. You have to adhere to Pacific, Pacific um, uh, mathematical equations when it comes to putting the, the correct amount out. Now, granted, a little extra roundup, it's not gonna hurt anything. But if you get pulled by the pesticide inspector, you need to tell them, hey, yeah, the label requires that I put two ounces per gallon of this chemical in it, and that's what I did. Um, trade name or brand, brand name. And guys, we're all familiar with Roundup. Roundup is that trade name, that brand name that they market to it. The salespeople go around, you know, setting up the displays at the big box stores. We see the TV commercials, and it's Roundup logo all over it. That is your trade or brand name. Uh, it's used in advertisement, indicates the formulation and the active ingredient. Uh, example, uh, Nomatodes 3E. Again, Nomatodes 3E is on, uh, starting on page 58, uh, but indicates that there is three pounds of active ingredient and the E means that it is emulsifiable concentrate. We're going to learn more about the uh, pesticide formulations in chapter five, the, your next lecture. Uh, and so, but just know that Nomatodes 3E, again, this is a fictional uh, label, you're going to see a label just like this on the, uh, the pesticide exam. And I'm pretty sure um, you're actually going to see a label twice. You're going to see one on the uh, O&T exam and you're going to see one on the core exam. Um, and don't choose your pesticide based on the trade name or brand name because they can be similar to other products. You know, and you're going to pay more uh, for that brand brand name that's that's been around like roundup you know guys the active ingredient is glyphosate now that that uh, patent is expired and stuff a lot of other uh, chemicals have came out using glyphosate in it so you know it's going to be a little bit cheaper using that off brand name versus you know the the brand name or store store name um, again we're looking at the rondo herbicide here again uh, the pesticide type and formulation. Guys, the pesticide type is a herbicide. Uh, the formulation, whether it's going to be an emulsifiable concentrate, a liquid, a granular, any of types of those. It's listed on the front of the label and contains a short statement. Example, herbicide for the control of woody brush and weeds. Uh, la, 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 this fix for education purposes. Avoid run, Rondo contact with foliage, green stems, exposed 91 roots or fruit of crops, except Rondo rip crops, Roundup ready, hence. Desirable plants and trees because severe danger will occur. Uh, but again, it's gonna tell you what we can use, uh, pretty, pretty um, short descriptive statement on what we can use it for. Here's another one, pesticide type and formulation. 
Uh, this is an insecticide and it is an SC. You see the uh, uh, M-Trade uh, 350. The SC stands for su suspension concentrate. And again, we're going to hit more about this in the next lecture. Here, another classification statement. This is a restricted use pesticide, karate, an insecticide. And probably a lot of your insecticides will probably be more of your restricted use pesticides because they're a little more dangerous, a little more dangerous for us than uh, you know, spraying for weeds out there. Uh, but it is restricted use. And it is, uh, it only has a warning label though. Um, you know, it's restricted because it's the toxicity to the fish and aquatic organisms. So it's not as bad for us, but it's a restricted use pesticide because uh, you're spraying around the water and it's dangerous to fish. You don't want to use it. Uh, um, and so we're probably not even going to um, uh, apply karate to any of our pro uh, properties. And for one, uh, you know, we're studying for ornamentals and turf, you know, subcategory L. We're not doing the aquatic slice, and that's a whole, whole other uh, thing when it comes to, uh, to uh, uh, pesticide license. But again, so we'll just notice that this only has a warning label. We're going to talk about, you know, uh, danger, uh, danger poison uh, here in the next couple slides. Your ingredient statement, the active ingredient, ingredient is the chemical in the pesticide formulation that destroys the pest or performs the desired function. Glyphosate and Roundup. Inert ingredient, not always named, but the label shows the percentage. Guys, that's just filler stuff. That is just the filler uh, that's in it. Your chemical name identifies the structure of the pesticide and the chemical components. We'll look at it on the label here in a minute. And then the common name, shorter, because the chemical name can be very complex and it must be officially accepted by the EPA to appear on the label. And so in your textbook, let's go ahead and turn to page 58. Let's look at the Nomatodes 3E label and go down to where the active ingredient is. That's four. It's going to say active ingredient, Krypton. Krypton is the common name. The actual brand name for this product is number one, Nomatodes 3E. But you come down to line four, the active ingredient is Krypton, and then the name to the right of Krypton, ethyl 3 phenyl methyl phosphoramidate is the actual chemical name uh, for this um, pesticide that we're using for for nematodes and I love the way they come up with the name nomo toads there's no more of them and also on the label we must have the EPA registration number it's going to appear on all pesticide labels that is number two there EPA registration number 66330-367 and then we have the EPA establishment number and that's going to identify the facility where the product was produced in case there was ever a mishap or anything that happened with this pesticide, they can track it back down to the plant because Monsito and these other big chemical companies, they probably got multiple um, uh, production sites across the country and across the world. Some of these pesticides may be made in other countries and they're sending them in. Here are our signal words, danger poison. And if it's danger poison, it's always gotta have pelegro uh, in there with it in Spanish. And then we have danger, and then warning, and then the caution. Now look, the warning, we just saw that restricted use pesticide that had a warning label, and we'll see what warning actually means. Because danger poison is always going to have the skull and crossbone. It is highly toxic, uh, whether which way it's entering the body, whether it's through skin, you know, dermal, uh, eyes, through mouth, through absorption, any of that stuff, it's going to be highly toxic to humans. Um, Warning. Warning is moderately toxic if entering through the mouth, skin, or inhalation. Again, there's that karate, and it has moderate eye and skin irritation. Even though that is an insecticide, it's only got a warning label on it, but it is restricted use because of the toxicity to fish and other aquatic animals. Caution, slightly toxic if entering through the skin, mouth, or inhalation. Slight eye or skin irritation, and we didn't talk about what the danger is. Danger is the product can involve sear eye damage uh, or skin irritation, whereas that danger poison, it's gotta have that skull and crossbones and it is toxic by any route uh, in the body. And again, that's what the EPA, during those six years, that's what they're determining. They're determining whether it's danger, poison, danger, warning, or caution needs to be added to the label. Your statement of first aid treatment. 
Uh, it is the statement of first aid and treatment in case of contact with skin, in case of contact with eyes, do this, in case of inhalation, do this. And that's uh, what we want to, uh, to find out when it comes to that. Precautionary statements uh, will be followed uh, when using the chemical may indicate which entry route, mouth, skin, or inhalation should be especially protected. Uh, actions taken to avoid acute, delayed, or allergic reactions. We'll learn more about that when we study uh, the first aid uh, part for uh, pesticide applications. But again, there's the precautionary statement, hazardous to hum humans and domestic animals, extremely ha hazardous liquid and vapor, if inhaled, may be fatal if swallowed. Burns to expose skin. Do not get in eyes on skin or on clothing. Vicane, specialty gas fumigant, is odorless. Exposure to toxic levels may occur without warning or detection by the user. Boom, that is some dangerous stuff there. That's when they're doing fumigation. Scary stuff there. A lot of times they'll add uh, tear gas to an odorless gas like this just so you can actually smell it. Um, PPE or personal protective equipment. Uh, and his recommendations on what the PPE should be worn to protect the user. Now, again, that's going to be different when mixing and handling the pesticide versus then applying it. It could be the same throughout the whole process, you know, start to finish, mix, uh, mix it, agitating it, getting it all together, ready to go, handling it. I mean, remember, you're handling a big five gallon, well not five gallon, two and a half gallon jug of a chemical, you're pouring it in a measuring cup, you need to be fully covered on some of these chemicals. Whereas when you're out just spraying it, you've got a less uh, concentrated mixture in a backpack shrub, um, in a backpack tank, so you're not maybe having to wear as much. But generally guys, when you're spraying, you need to have, you need to have rubber boots, you need to have waterproof boots for spraying Roundup stuff. You need to wear long pants, you need to wear long sleeve shirts, and you definitely need to wear eye protection and um, uh, you know, just depending on what it is, you may have to have some type of gas or um, you know, not a ventilator, but a um, respirator. Um, sorry, thinking medical there, but have a, a respirator on. Just depends on what it is, but definitely the minimum uh, should be long sleeve, rubber gloves, long pants, and uh, you know, rubber boots or at least waterproof boots. But I've seen guys out spraying Roundup with flip flops and shorts on. And I've seen guys out there weed eating with uh, shorts and flip flops on, so I don't really understand that. But anyway, um, environmental hazards and general information there's going to be warnings on the label to prevent runoff and drift. And then, what if there's any physical and chemical hazards, whether the stuff is flammable or corrosive? So, you may not want to keep it. It's going to talk about exposed temperatures. You know, it can only reach this hot in the storage shed uh, before it could ignite. So, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of information with that and some stuff that could really uh, get you in trouble. Because the pesticide applicator, they can pull you over, they see you at the gas station, they'll pull up, identify themselves, or they can make a unwanted or um, unannounced uh, visit to your shop to see how you store your pesticide. Your directions for use, the section specifically details how to use, store, and dispose of the pesticides. And remember, again, the label is the law. Guys, you have to, have to follow uh, the label. So read it. You know, guys, just don't go purchase a, a pesticide and ask the dealer, how many ounces per gallon am I supposed to put in there? Guys, calibrate your equipment, read the label, and determine that yourself. Determine that yourself. It's different for each site. And, you know, calibrating your equipment depends on how fast you walk, not how fast the guy behind the sales counter um, sold you, how fast he can walk. Make sure, you, make sure you're doing it right. Storage and disposal. General instructions for the storage and disposal of the chem chemical in the container uh, may be under the headings labeled important, note, or general instructions. So read those because you want to know how to store it. You want to know how to dispose of those empty containers. You may want to lock it up. Lock your pesticides up in your truck. Have a box that keeps them locked or on your trailer. You don't need to have it where anybody can get access to it. Number one is it not, it's dangerous to begin with, but guys, you're losing money. You know, we all complain when we lose a backpack blower, backpack sprayer, but what if you use, lose a $500 pint of an insecticide that's just laying loose in the back of your truck? You know, the only other person that's going to know what that is is another landscaper. Lock it up. Name and address of the manufacturers on there. Um, net contents. 
you know, how much product is in the container, whether it's in pounds or ounces, if it's dry, and if it's in gallons, quarts, or pints, if it's a wet or a liquid. And as you can see right there, circled up this uh, uh, Demon EC, Demon Emulsifiable Concentrated is an insecticide. It is one pint. And there's no telling how much that stuff costs. And then look at the active ingredient. And there is your common name, chloroth chlorethanol or whatever. Guys, I have trouble with these names just like you do. I've heard them many times, but if you don't pronounce them every day, you're going to do it. And there is uh, your, um, uh, your chemical name. And that uh, chlorethanol is your um, common name. And then Demon EC is your trade name. So the basic parts of the label again. Uh, agricultural use requirements only on pesticides covered by the EPA worker uh, protection standard, the WPS, and this is the protection of agricultural workers because years ago there were several that got actually sick uh, from that and, um, um, you know, they've got to be protected, especially immigrant workers, you know, not speaking English and stuff like that. we got to kind of make sure we're taking care of our... Uh, um, of our workers. We've got to protect them all, guys. I mean, this is something dangerous, and you're talking about a major workers' comp claim. That uh, could be uh, very damaging to the, uh, the pocketbook. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about, look at Table 4.2 on 63 in your textbook. That is some sample information found in the directions for use. Uh, the pest that the manufacturer claims the product will control, the crop, animal, or site the product is intended to protect, uh, the rate how much to use and how often, um, the pre-harvest interval, how many days before the harvest product can be applied, uh, phytotoxicity, the damage to the plants and other possible injury, other restrictions, recropping, composting, grazing. You know, we used to um, um, bag all of our grass that we mowed, uh, run walkers, we've run walkers, you know, pretty much my entire career. Uh, don't have as many as we did in the day, but we actually bought a um, walker manufacturing trailer that had a basket that, you know, we could push a button on the side of the walker and that basket came down. We backed up to it. Some of our walkers had the automatic dump. Other ones didn't. Uh, but you back up to it, dump it, and then when you drive off, you hit the button and the basket would just kind of creep up and it would dump into uh, a walking floor trailer. And then two walkers would set up front. Um, in front of the hopper that, that had it. And it was almost like a manure spreader. And we would fill that box up. You know, guys, we'd fill it up two or three times a day, uh, depending on some of the commercial sites we were cutting. And we would always take it back to the farm and feed it to our Angus cattle. Well, we couldn't do that all the time because we may have treated some of the lawns. And so we'd have to uh, not put that in the pasture for, for the cows. To eat. We could only do it uh, certain times um, or so many days after pesticide applications. Uh, review this pesticide label. Again, it's a restricted use pesticide. It's vaporized WP for wettable powder. Uh, that is the trade name. Uh, the formulation is the wettable powder. The mode of action, it is a group 10 insecticide. The active ingredients is vaporin, and, th that, is, well, and, and that is also the common name. And then your chemical name is that 2 vaporizin in dihydrogen and monoxide, and it is at 12%. And then the other ingredients, we talked about inert ingredients, is 88%. The net content uh, is five pounds. Uh, there's the EPA registration, and then the establishment number, you know, where, which manufacturing uh, facility it was made at. There's the manufacturer and its address. The signal word is caution. Keep out of reach of the children's precautionary statements, and there's more uh, um, precautionary statements. Hazardous to humans and uh, domestic animals. We got our first aid there in 12. We got our PPE, use safety recommendations. All of that is in the uh, precautionary statements. Directions for use, and that'll say that a lot. You know, you'll see directions for use on it. And then you got storage and disposal. So this is a very good example uh, of what should be on a label. And our material safety data sheets. Uh, these uh, manufacturers require to develop an MSDA sheet for each product and provide it upon request. I mean, so your dealer's not necessarily going to give it to you, but again, most of this stuff you can find online. So print it off and stick it in that notebook um, that, that we always did. Um, the components, a chemical product identification, whether it's fire and ex uh, explosive hazards, uh, and we're talking about this on page 65, the physical and chemical properties of the uh, pesticide, the, toxicolo the tox 
ecological information and the human health data, and then a PPE that's recommended for it, and then any additional information. And then on page 65 and on to 66, read those bullets that talk about the, uh, the components of the MSDS sheet. And guys, that will wrap up chapter four. I try to keep these lectures short and sweet so you don't have to sit in front of a computer uh, for an hour or so. We're trying to keep them uh, chunked up into um, uh, short um, lectures. But again, always read the chapter before watching the lecture and then go back and highlight your text. But guys, I appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next lecture.